That's right, you've been a naughty, naughty platter. That's why I'm spanking you. It's because you've been misbehaving. I'm not going to put up with you anymore. That's not abuse. It's just discipline. So please don't call Vinyl Protective Services on me. Greetings one and all and welcome once again to Tom's Hit Parade. Well, the year is halfway over. Can you believe it? I certainly can't. But uh, yes, since it is the end of June and the end of the second quarter of the year, it is naturally time for my next Spankin' Platters video. Yes, that is the quarterly video in which I round up all or most of the new and recently released albums that I've picked up and enjoyed over the last three months and present them to you, give you guys my thoughts on them and whatnot. And uh, I am not much of an album review kind of guy. Uh, those of you who've been uh, with my channel for a while, you guys know that. But I think with this Spankin' Platters thing, I have hit the sweet spot. I go, you know, every three months, just about every three months, I get the itch to get that little um, inner music critic out of my brain, let him out for a little fresh air and to interact with you guys and say hello. Uh, but yes, other than that, I am just not much of an al uh, a music critic. I'm much more of a music fan. So yes, this is my chance every... Uh, three months to bring you guys uh, what I think of albums uh, that have come out recently. And uh, you might have noticed that in the winter edition of Spankin' Platters uh, was an indication that the year kind of start got off to a slow start. I only talked about four albums in that video, uh, but uh, things have picked up. Uh, you'll be happy to know I've got actually six things to talk about in this video. And those of you who are um, analog aficionados who may have lamented the lack of vinyl in my Winter Spankin' Platters video, uh, only one of the four albums that I did in that video was on vinyl, uh, you'll be much more uh, happy with this video. I've actually got a ratio of pretty much half and half vinyl to CDs. So anyway, without wasting any more time, I've got several albums to get through here. Let's go ahead and get started. Kicking off the proceedings today is Weezer with their 15th album, Van Weezer. Now this is the first and may very well be the only time that you see the same artist make an appearance in two consecutive Spankin' Platters videos. But if Weezer is going to release two albums in less than six months, they made a very wise decision in making them both relatively short, less than 31 minutes each, in contrast to the artists who love to unload tediously long albums on us, but also that they made them so vastly different from each other in their sonic palette. While OK Human had lots of strings and lush pop textures with no electric guitars to be found, essentially, Van Weezer, on the other hand, has almost nothing but fuzzy, crunchy electric guitars, a true return to the classic form of their early days, the Blue Album, Pinkerton, etc., while also serving as a tribute to the band's personal guitar heroes of the 80s. Now, as to be expected, anyone who loves 80s hard rock and metal will probably like this album, and those of us who remember living through that era of music firsthand will likely experience a bit of a nostalgia trip listening to it. And by the way, for those who may not know, the album had the tentative title Van Weezer as early as February of 2019, over a year and a half before the great Eddie Van Halen passed away. And speaking of Eddie Van Halen, The End of the Game, which was prophetically the album's first single, opens with a lick that's reminiscent of his eruption guitar solo. By contrast, the use of the riff from Ozzy Osbourne's Crazy Train in the track Blue Dream is puzzling and pointless, since it has nothing to do whatsoever with the rest of the song. But that's one of the very few bad moments on the album. You don't have to do a lot of searching to find catchy lyrical hooks or tasty guitar licks on this album. Overall, I found the lyrics to have less depth than on OK Human, but then that's another nice contrast in my opinion. Most of them are about various facets of romantic relationships, but there are a couple of exceptions. Opening track Hero is a kind of anti-anthem, if there is such a thing, in which the singer acknowledges that he fell short of the heroic aspirations of his childhood, and the references to superheroes, slinging webs, flying in capes, etc., feeds into my appreciation for comic book characters. I Need Some of That is an unabashed nostalgia trip, and the lyrical nods to music, a mention of martial amplifiers, and the name drop of Aerosmith, of course appeal to my fetish for songs about music. And one more hit can be forgiven for the cringy pump it into me daddy lyric when you realize that it's a thought-provoking song about drug addiction. And while I'm on the subject of cringy Weezer lyrics, let's be real here. I firmly believe that anyone who gets too critical of a silly lyric in the occasional Weezer song takes the band far more seriously than even Weezer themselves have probably ever intended to be taken. But anyway, back to the album. Uh, I noticed a few nods back to earlier Weezer songs hidden in this album. For instance, All of the Good Ones opens up with a stompy beat that's reminiscent of their hit Beverly Hills, 
and the end of the game seems to include a sly lyrical reference to Island in the Sun by talking about an island with no sun. Overall, this is a great album. Uh, most critics are calling it Weezer's best in years, and I would be hard-pressed to argue. Though I'm not as critical with Weezer's discography as most other people are, I will admit, uh, both of their albums this year are neck and neck, in my opinion, in my uh, current album of the year ranking, at least as of right now. Van Weezer has the better instrumentals, but OK Human edges out in terms of the lyrics. But still, uh, I don't think any Weezer fans, especially long-time Weezer fans, will be disappointed in this album. If you have not ch given it a try yet, check it out. I think you'll like it. Next up in this edition of Spankin' Platters is the first of three vinyl LPs that I'll be talking about today. This one is Now and Then by Paul Stanley Soul Station. Now, I'll be honest with you, KISS is one of those bands that I have never been able to get into. I have tried, uh, or uh, really understand how other people can be so into them. But I refuse to belittle anyone who is, uh, since I do my best to rise above being any sort of music snob. I refer you to the tagline at the end of each of my videos. Uh, but I have seen interviews with Paul Stanley, and there's something I like about him. He's very well-spoken, very articulate, and very knowledgeable about many different kinds of music. So that fact, plus my appreciation for classic soul and R&B, which is I knew what, uh, that that was going to be the genre of this album, made me unable to resist picking up this set. Now, the 14 songs on this album consist of nine covers of soul and R&B classics and five original songs written by Paul Stanley. The originals range from the soft, tender balladry of I Do and the smoothly soulful Save Me From You to the upbeat Motown bounce of I.O.I. and the delightful duet Whenever You're Ready with Crystal Carr. And since there's just one original left to mention, I might as well point out Lorelei with its specter-esque wall of sound. The best compliment I can probably give the originals is that they intermingle perfectly with the covers. So if you weren't an expert on classic soul, you could easily mistake those five tracks for having been around as long as the other nine. The gently uplifting Ooh Child, originally by the Five Stair Steps, the Temptations classic Just My Imagination, Smokey Robinson's Tracks of My Tears and Ooh Baby Baby, and the Al Green Chestnut Let's Stay Together are particular highlights among the covers, but every single one of them is a wonderfully done tribute to its original. Now, to be totally honest, Paul Stanley's voice may not be the best I've ever heard in the Soul Revival and Covers game, but if the only mode you've ever heard him in is the hard rock repertoire of Kiss, this album is going to surprise you, I think. Uh, his voice lends itself very well to this genre and has a subtlety and a tenderness that I wasn't expecting. So, but yes, this album is a total treat, uh, especially if you're as fond as I am of that old Motown, Stax, and Atlantic soul and R&B of the 60s. Don't pass up listening to this one. It's fantastic. And especially if you, kind of like me, uh, you enjoy or you appreciate listening to a different side of an artist that you normally don't get to hear, uh, a favorite artist of yours. So, uh, you know, not that Paul Stanley or Kiss are a favorite artist of mine, but still, I, I don't think you'll be disappointed in this uh, fantastic slice of throwback R&B soul. Moving right along, we come to Ancient Dreams in a Modern Land, the fifth album by Marina, formerly Marina and the Diamonds. Now, I have a bit of a complicated relationship with Marina. I first discovered her a few years back when I found a used copy of her album Fruit on CD, and I liked it enough that I picked up her two previous albums a short while later. But it took forever for Love and Fear to grow on me, as did several albums back in 2019 for some reason. At the same time, I lost interest in her earlier albums and ended up putting all four of her CDs in my Discogs inventory. By the time I checked out the singles from this album, I had sold the first three, but thankfully not Love and Fear. I gave it one more listen, changed my mind on selling it, I ordered this CD as well, and here we are. Those of you who know me well enough can probably guess that the overwhelmingly 80s vibe on this album is what drew me into it. From the ecstatic synthwave groove on track one, to the spacey electric guitar riff echoing through a mid-tempo ballad near the end of the album, this may be the most sonically scrumptious record since Lady Gaga's Chromatica. And it certainly doesn't hurt that the album has a much more modest runtime than Love and Fear did. Now, while the sound of this album overall is much more upbeat than her last, reflected partly by the huge difference between Love and Fear's subdued black-and-white album art and Ancient Dream's burst of Technicolor, 
The lyrical content is perhaps more substantive, with at least half the tracks taking on things like social issues and existential concepts. The opening title track jumps right into the fray by suggesting that we've allowed society to preoccupy us with our 21st century wants and our first world problems to such a degree that it's distracted us from the fact that most of the third world is still going without, in some cases, even 19th century necessities and calling upon the up and coming generation to change that. The female empowerment anthem Venus Flytrap and follow-up indictment against misogyny, Man's World, are, in my opinion, perfectly decent arguments for putting an end to the patriarchy. Purge the Poison, I have a feeling, drew inspiration from the dramatic reduction our city saw in pollution during the first few months of the pandemic, and it invites us to look into our collective mirror and see all the damage we've done to the environment and to society. Then we come to Highly Emotional People. I can't describe to you how much I love all the lyrics in this song. With its abstractions about fate's place for us in the universe, it feeds right into my own personal brand of spirituality. On a smaller scale, it's about the validity of our emotions, an especially important message given the hell we all went through over the past year and a half. And New America is a scathing critique of our country in the form of casting a harsh light on the social, economic, racial, and cultural exploitation that built the country in the first place and made it into what it is today, in a way challenging us to atone for that exploitation in spite of or perhaps because of our love for our country. The last four songs on this album are essentially love songs, so their lyrical content pales by comparison, to me anyway. And I'm a little bit puzzled as to why Marina sequenced the album like this, uh, rather than interspersing the love songs evenly throughout the track list. But that's a small complaint, and besides, perhaps she felt it appropriate to bring us down from the big issues into the more simple person-to-person -person stuff. Be that as it may, I was unexpectedly won over by this album, big time. And to think I didn't realize it was out until a week after it dropped, and I almost missed it altogether. I don't see myself returning to her first three records anytime soon, but I hear a maturity in Love and Fear and this album that I have a feeling is going to keep me in her camp for quite a while, especially uh, with uh, all of her future projects that she may come up with. So yes, excellent, wonderful album, one of my favorites of the year so far. Okay, now on to the next album in my vinyl column, I guess you'd say. We have The Offspring with their 10th album, Let the Bad Times Roll. It is their first album in nine years, incidentally. Now, to be honest, this is my first full album listen to The Offspring. Uh, I do have their greatest hits CD. I'm fond of quite a few of their singles. But there were basically two things that compelled me to listen to this album. Uh, first of all, it's the fact that it was produced by Bob Rock. I don't necessarily love everything he's produced, but uh, I do like a lot of what he's produced, and he's produced such a broad array of things, all sorts of different genres, that I almost always have to give at least a listen to anything he has produced. But also, and a reason that you might find a little weird is the fact that it's on the Concord label is the other reason I picked it up. Uh, Concord is a label that's more known for its jazz releases than rock, so this is, I think, one of the first uh, forays into the rock genre for the Concord label. So. I kind of had to pick it up, and maybe just because of the subliminal suggestion, maybe that it had some jazz influences in it. But anyway, if there's one thing about this album that disappoints me, and it's a minor one, uh, I kind of expected a bit more of the raucous, punkish sound of earlier Offspring. Pretty Fly for a White Guy, Come Out and Play, that kind of stuff. Uh, that's not to say that this album doesn't have that kind of energy, because it certainly does. And a few of the tracks approach that punkish level of power. Army of One, for instance, is probably the biggest and best anthem on the album. Its lyrics alluding to the chaos the country and the world have been going through over the last few years. Some of the lyrics elsewhere on the album deal with more recent events in the world. Breaking These Bones has lyrics that allude to the isolation brought on by the pandemic and the psychological consequences. The opening track, This Is Not Utopia, has a self-explanatory title and describes the socio-political unrest that's been tearing through America lately. The Opioid Diaries, as indicated by its title, deals with the epidemic of prescription drug addiction and the people who have been getting rich off of it. Hassan Chop has lyrics that allude to the ongoing fighting in the Middle East, but the lyrics in those two songs are not quite as subtle as in the songs I mentioned earlier. Now, Side 2 is definitely the more interesting side with arguably weird detours, including an interlude based on the classical composition In the Hall of the Mountain King by Grieg, and the closing track, Lullaby, which is a slow, balladish reprise of the title track's chorus. It's okay, but it's a little bit weird. And there's also an acoustic ballad rendition of their classic hit single, Gone Away, which is not bad. I mean, I always appreciate hearing a different take on a song by its original artist. 
Now, I have heard some negative criticism of the song We Never Have Sex Anymore, but to me, it harkens back to the more tongue-in-cheek offspring singles of the past, like Pretty Fly for a White Guy. So, for that reason, I really have no problem with it all at all. In fact, it, it really kind of livens up the album for me. So, but, so, but yes, all in all, I am quite satisfied with this album, and I am very glad that I picked it up and took a chance on it. Uh, it's uh, making me think about exploring the Offspring's past discography in more detail. So yes, uh, very good. It's not a perfect album, but it's very, very good, and a great uh, first full album by uh, the Offspring for me, and it won't be my last. Okay, now, the next to last item on my list today is a bit of an unusual one. It's a two-for-one deal. What a bargain, right? I mean, you always get your money's worth with Tom's Hit Parade, especially considering you don't pay anything for this video. But anyway, it is Heart and Soul by Eric Church. Now, this is my first exposure to Eric Church. I don't think I've ever heard any of his singles, and I certainly couldn't name any of them. But my slowly expanding taste for country music and the reviews of both of these albums by my friend Ryan over at True North Reviews convinced me to give them a try. And also because each of these two discs has a very easy to digest length of nine tracks at just over half an hour runtime each. Now, as you can tell by their complimentary cover art, these two discs are meant to be part of a larger overall work with the six track EP ampersand or and sandwiched between them, heart and soul. But that EP has only been available thus far through Church's Fan Club, so for the record, this review is only going to talk about these two albums. Heart and Soul is considered his seventh release, but in terms of physical output, I call Heart his seventh album and Soul his eighth, going by their actual physical release dates one week apart. Now, the title of each disc might suggest that the majority of songs on Heart have to do with love and relationships, while the Soul volume might address more philosophical and existential subject matter, and with its musical connotation, you might expect soul to have more of a soul music sound and assume that heart sticks to a more ballad-heavy country aesthetic. Well, the fact notwithstanding that a third of the tracks on heart have the word heart in their titles, neither of these aforementioned assumptions holds true. But that doesn't necessarily detract from the overall enjoyment of this album cycle. If anything, elements of all the things that I just described can be heard on both halves, which makes the whole thing feel like a unified, cohesive work. For instance, the Hammond B3 organ, which for many people is synonymous with soul music, is heard on six of the nine tracks on each set. But if you were to take the titles Heart and Soul literally, their major radio singles arguably should have been on each other's discs. Stick That in Your Country Song calls attention to several societal ills that most of country music, and by extension Middle America, would prefer to pretend aren't there. So it would seem to fit in more with soul, but it's actually on heart. Whereas Hell of a View is a love song, a standout one with its you holding me holding you lyric that you'd think belongs on heart, but it's actually on soul. Now, as you might expect, the songs that reference music in their lyrics, such as Heart on Fire and Russian Roulette from Heart and Rock and Roll Found Me and Leonard Skinner Jones from Soul, would score points with me, and they do. And then there are the more catchy, toe-tapping and head-bobbing songs like Bunch of Nothing and Break It Kinda Guy. Never Break Heart sounds like an awkward and grammatically incorrect title, but when you hear the lyrics, it not only makes sense, but it's a very, very pretty ballad and one of the better songs on the album. And Love Shine Down is a beautiful anthemic ballad, if there is such a thing, that serves as Heart's closing track. Look Good and You Know It lives up to the title of the disc it's on, because it's probably the most soul-flavored song in the entire Heart and Soul cycle, and definitely one of the best and Bad Mother Trucker stands out as another highlight on the soul section for its cheeky sense of humor. So yes, I have to say that these two discs left me with a great first impression of Eric Church, and it's probably not going to be long before I seek out some more of his music to see if anything else I've been missing of his is as good as these batches of songs. So yeah, excellent stuff. One of the standout releases from this spring that I think everybody should check out, country music fan or not. Okay, now, last for today, but definitely not least, although probably the most surprising for a lot of you guys out there, we have Companies Coming by Leslie Jordan. Now, for those of you unfamiliar, Le Leslie Jordan is an actor who's most famous for his recurring role on Will and Grace. Uh, he's always brought a smile to my face whenever I've seen him in anything. Uh, he's just got that southern charm and sweetness about him, uh, which stands to reason because he was born and raised in Tennessee. So I had such a strong feeling that it would carry over into this album that I couldn't resist giving it a try, even though it's gospel. Yes, uh, I have made it no secret on this channel that I do not care for Christian music, at least not the contemporary Christian like the pop and the rock and the hip-hop stuff, or the praise and worship stuff. 
if there's one subgenre of Christian music that I'd have any chance of getting into, it'd probably be gospel, especially the soul-based gospel music commonly heard in black churches, because of the jubilance and soulfulness that comes from it. Indeed, that's where soul music originated, was from gospel. Now, that being said, this record consists of the more reserved, country-rooted gospel spirituals, but it's still a fun and uplifting album with an impressive array of guest artists, from country and gospel legends like Tanya Tucker, to contemporary Americana artists like Chris Stapleton. And there are a few names I'm not familiar with, which was become to be expected, as well as an unexpected name hiding in here. Leslie Jordan may not have the strength or presence normally found in a lead vocalist. Not that it matters a whole lot in this genre, really, though, since when you get down to it, gospel is much more about the spirit behind the singing than the proficiency or accuracy of the singing itself but that doesn't take away one bit from the enjoyment of these songs. Out of all the songs on this album, the one that I'm probably the most familiar with is the opening track, This Little Light of Mine. Who hasn't heard that song, really? Which features Katie Pruitt, and it is a lovely, lovely way to start the album. Uh, Leslie's duets with the one and only Dolly Parton on Where the Soul Never Dies and Tanya Tucker on When the Roll is Called Up Yonder are absolute highlights on this record as well. Just fantastic tracks. Now, perhaps the most interesting track on here is the one with the most interesting guest, Eddie Vedder, on The One Who Hideth Me. The instrumental is given a bit of a heavy sound, perhaps drawing inspiration from Vedder's Pearl Jam roots. Although, to be honest, his vocal is perhaps the least impressive of all the singers on this album. But then, of course, I refer you back to what I just said a minute ago about vocal perfection not being a super important ingredient in gospel. Working on a Building, which includes Ashley McBride and Charlie Worsham, is probably the most rejoiceful song on the whole record. And In All Things, featuring Danny Myrick, is also very, very enjoyable. But my biggest takeaway from this album, I think, is that I need to check out the music of The Brothers Osborne. T.J. Osborne features on the song In the Sweet By and By, and coincidentally, it was recorded shortly before T.J. came out publicly, a thing that Leslie mentioned in an interview that they talked about at the time. But I just love TJ's rich baritone voice. It gave me the good kind of goosebumps. One of the nice little touches on this record are the interludes between the tracks, which are snippets of studio chatter or impromptu jam sessions. You hear a bit of I'll Fly Away at one point, and He's Got the Whole World in His Hands is also hiding between the songs. Now, in the liner notes for this album, Leslie mentions that although he parted ways with the church after realizing he's gay because he felt the church had no place for him, he came around to recording this album because the songs were a big part of his childhood, and in recent years he's come to realize what a great unifier music can be. And that's one of the things I love about music as well. Uh, despite our ideological differences, cultural differences, we can bond over music in ways that we can't uh, connect over other things. Uh, it's kind of the same thing with food. Food and music, are, I think, are the two big unifiers. And that even goes with a genre like gospel, when it's stripped of any societal undertones and it's brought back to its essence. And I gotta tell you, I am feeling it. Deep down with this album, this is such a very hugely enjoyable album for me. And yeah, even for this guy who doesn't like Christian music. I know, right? I, I am just so glad that I listened to my hunch that I'd like this album, and I think it's an album that my sister might have enjoyed too. Uh, she was a person of faith in her teenage and college years, although she moved mostly moved away from it in her adulthood. And as I recall, she got a, a chuckle out of Leslie Jordan's character on Will and Grace as well. So, But anyway, yes, if you are looking for a bit of spiritual uplift, I think this album will give it to you. G give it a try, and especially if you like uh, Christian or spiritual or gospel music. And even if you don't, give it a try. I think Leslie Jordan's charm will win you over. It, it certainly did with me. Well, I guess that about wraps it up, and just in time, because I think my voice is starting to fail me, that'll do it for Spankin' Platters for spring of 2021. I hope you enjoyed this video. If so, hit that like button and share it with your friends, and give me your thoughts, questions, suggestions, or constructive criticisms in the comments section below. Also, scroll down to the description for the links to my Twitter and Instagram feeds, and links to my favorite fellow YouTubers who are all worth checking out. And don't forget to subscribe to my channel and browse my past videos, and be sure to ring that notifications bell so you'll be the first to know each time I drop a new video. Otherwise, thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time, and remember, life's too short to be a music snob.